All right. Hey, would you do me a favor? Let's welcome all of our friends who are watching online today right now. Let's just put our hands together. God bless you guys. Great to have you on board with us. A couple weeks ago, we started a teaching series on the Ten Commandments as a foundation for our lives, a foundation for a stable society. We're going to pick up on that series and continue it next Sunday. But this Sunday for Father's Day, I thought it would be really special to have another friend join us who's over the years really truly become a friend to our church. Uh, Bill Hackett uh, serves as the academic provost over at Southeastern University. And uh, he basically runs the school, basically what that, that role is all about. And uh, he truly has become a friend. He speaks a couple times a year or, or at least once a year. And uh, I just really felt like he had a, a word for our church, a, a word of encouragement. And uh, after having heard what he taught last service, definitely a right on time word of encouragement for us. So would you do me a favor? Put your hands together. Let's welcome Bill Hackett as he comes today. Bless you, Doug. Appreciate you, man. Steve and Gayla, we will miss you, and uh, you've always been head and shoulders above me, so I will continue to look up to you, Steve, and uh, if you ever had a conversation with him, I, I can't believe what wit he has, and he always has me laughing for some reason, but he is multi-talented, so is his wife, and we pray for a safe journeys as you travel, all right, appreciate you very much. Hey, Dave uh, called me probably about a month ago and asked if I would speak on June 21st today. And I didn't realize it was Father's Day. And uh, at that time, we were right in the midst of, you know, dealing with this new normal. Uh, thus, I have my, uh, my mask and so forth. But the pandemic, and I thought, okay, maybe I should address that. And then the, the past uh, couple of weeks, we've, we've dealt with uh, racial and diversity issues in our country, national news and so forth all over the country and dealing with that. And, okay, do I talk about that? And then it's Father's Day. All right, so what do I speak about on this particular thing? Uh, there's a passage in Scripture in First Chronicles uh, chapter 12 where David is talking about his mighty men of valor, his soldiers, all right, guys and what they've done and how, you know, one guy slayed 300 and all this kind of stuff type of thing. But in the midst of that, there's a, a, a strange little verse that says, and he also had the men from the tribe of Issachar who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. And, and as I look at that verse, I think, man, that's, that's a verse that we need to look at all the time. So even as, as a university at Southeastern, we're, we're un, trying to understand the times and, and know what we should do. How do we, how do we have semester in the fall with, the, you know, with the proper distancing and, and so forth? And when people coming in from all over the world, really, to our campus, different countries as well as different states, what should we do? And I, I prayed that prayer just for this Sunday as well. What should I speak on, Lord? And so forth. And uh, many different thoughts came to me, but I kind of settled on this. It is Father's Day. So uh, I thought, what is our Heavenly Father? What would He speak to us in the midst of the times that we're living in? And, and particularly as well, along with Father's Day, what would our Heavenly Father say? And, and a, a number of different passages have come to me. I usually just kind of park in one particular passage and look at that. But I have a, a few that I want to look at today that kind of carries a theme on what I think God is saying to us individually, uh, as fathers, as families, as well as the church, as well as the country. How do we go through these times? And what does our Lord want to focus in on? There's a passage that uh, in Psalm 133, it's only three verses. It's written by King David. And it's known as a whole series of them in this part of Psalms as a Psalm of Ascent. Uh, they were Psalms that the, the people of Israel would say to themselves as they were ascending to Jerusalem, which is on a mountain, and as they were ascending there, particularly for Passover, and they would go through these various Psalms. And this one is short, and, and it, like me, and, and it, it kind of deals with something that really, to me, is the heart of God. And, and this is what it says. It says, uh, behold or look how good and pleasant it is when God's people dwell together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard. This is Moses' brother. This is the first high priest and so there's this image of his consecration as a priest and anointing as a priest with oil 
being poured down, not only on his head, but in abundance that it's dripping off his face, off his beard, onto his, uh, to his, his, his garments, showing just the love of God and the anointing of God on him. And then it says, it is as the dew of Hermon. If you, if you Google Mount Hermon and the, the, the Hermon Mountains, you'll see them all snow-capped. And it's actually today the only place in Israel where they actually have a ski resort. It's in the northern part, north of the Sea of Galilee, nor, north of Caesarea Philippi, and it's in a very fertile place. Most of, probably 75, 80% of Israel is a dry, arid, barren land. But in the northern part and along the coast, it's the most fertile. And, and this is a symbol of, of just of flourishing and growth and so forth. And so it's, it, it pictures that idea of, of just growth and nourishing and, um, you know, just thriving. And it says, it is the dew of Hermon. We're falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord be bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Now, I, I had the, the, the people put up the NIV ver version of this, and I was kind of disappointed after I looked at it and studied it, because it just talks about how good and pleasant it is. That's how it opens up. But really, they miss a word in the very beginning of the pa passage. It's behold, or look. In other words, David is saying under the anointing as he's writing this down, we ought to look at this. We ought to behold this. We ought to look how good and pleasant it is when, when brothers and sisters, when people can come together in unity. Behold, this is good to look at. And, and notice he says how good and pleasant it is. Uh, you know, some things can be good and not pleasant. Exercise. Maybe dieting. You know, some things like going to school. Maybe even going to work. It's good, you know, in, 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 in a sense that it's good for us and it puts food on the table if it's work or something. But it's not always pleasant. And some things can be pleasant and not good. Sin falls into this category. Pleasant for a season. At the time it looks pleasant. But the long-term results of that can be dangerous for us. And that's why God opposes that sort of thing. And so what, what David is saying here is, look, when we're in unity with one another, that is both good and pleasant at the same time. And in fact, let me give you this illustration, he says. It's like the anointing of, of Aaron, the high priest. And not just an anointing, it's anointing where there's an abundance showing with the oil coming down even on his garments. It's as the dew of Hermon, you know, in this arid land that's going to be life and refreshment. This is something that's good when we come together and we're in unity. God is pleased with that. You see, this is the plan that God had in the very beginning, and we see it in the Garden of Eden. We find that in the Garden of Eden, that, that uh, the two individuals there, Adam and Eve, are naked and unashamed. And I, I think that nakedness is more than just physically naked. I think it's in the sense that they were exposed to one another in any way, with their thoughts, with their feelings, and, and there was nothing that they wanted to hide. There was nothing that they wanted to put a mask over. There was no pretending. They, they could be open with their thoughts and feelings with one another, and they were unashamed about that. They said they, they, they would walk in the garden with God and have that, that openness with him. They were naked before him. Hey, this is who I am. Accept me as I am. I have nothing to fear at that point. Naked and unashamed. And, and, and they were open and honest with themselves. And they felt good in themselves. There was nothing in themselves that they wanted to hide. And yet when they decide, decided to eat of that forbidden fruit because they wanted to become like God, they were not satisfied with who they are. And, and, and they wanted to become like God. And when they sinned, all that changed. The first thing they did is they went and covered themselves because all of a sudden, like being naked was something that they were fearful of and ashamed of. So they go and they hide from God when God comes looking for them. Because, and now there's a, there's a problem where they not even open with themselves. They start accusing one another. When, when God asked Adam, why do you do this? And he said, well, by the way, God, this woman that you gave me caused me to eat of it. He's even blaming God. So the idea of this harmony, this oneness, this unity that existed between Adam and Eve and between Adam and Eve and God and with Adam with himself and Eve with himself and even with creation, they were one with it. There was no killing in the garden at this point. They must have been all vegetarians. 
Maybe we're glad they did sin because we like beef. Okay. But, you know, uh, there was no killing at that. There was lions and tigers and bears there, and, and nobody's killing one another at that time. But the moment their sin, shame enters in and they're disunified. Not feeling comfortable about themselves, they're ashamed of themselves, accusing one another, accusing God. There's a separation there. And so this is why God sent Christ into the world to, to bring forth a way that we can get back to the harmony and the unity that God intended for us to have. I don't think heaven's going to be a place where we're fighting with one another. I think we'll see the ultimate root of what God wanted in the first place. And we can have that even now as, as we allow Christ to enter into our life and, and to, to help us to overcome difficulties, even in a marriage or in society or even our country today and what's going on there. I think churches should be at the front and Christians should be at the front of showing that unity and harmony. And so that's what God wanted. So how good and pleasant it is and notice that the last verse says, for there the Lord bestows his blessing. When God sees that harmony and unity in the church, he is pleased and he blesses it. It's fascinating to me that in 1 Corinthians, when they were practicing community, they weren't in harmony. Some were coming and having a big meal and others were coming and they didn't have the money to have a big meal and there was no sharing. And so Paul tells him in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, some of you are sick and some of you are dying because you're not practicing the unity and harmony and love that should be that when you come together. You're not respecting the body of Christ. Not only Jesus' body, but the church's body. In fact, in the first chapter, he tells us that he writes the letter because there's divisions among them. Some say there are Paul, some of Apollos, some of Cephas, and some of Christ. And they're making all these little subgroups in the church, and they're not coming together, and they're actually combating one another. And so in chapter 3, he says, you know, I, I can't give you more than just milk, because I can't give you solid food because you're, 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 you're immature. Why? Because you're fighting in, with one another. When one says there are Paul or one says Apollos, you're, you're causing division. In fact, he's so upset with this that in the 16th verse of chapter 3, he says this. He says, you know, you are the body of Christ. And, and that's where the spirit dwells. And then he says this. If any person destroys that church by causing division, separation, disharmony, God will destroy him. I remember when I first read that word destroy, it means to annihilate. God doesn't like it when, when people cause division and cause discomfort and cause people to be disunified. He wants that harmony. That's his whole heart. In fact, as we, we go to John chapter 17, it's a prayer that Jesus has in the upper room. They've already had the, the Lord's Supper. He's already washed their feet. He has spent some time with them in, in chapters 13 through 16, preparing them for his departure and the fact that he's going to go to the cross. They're still not fully grasping that. And he's telling them, hey, I'm going to send you another comforter. The Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to speak my words. He's going to affirm everything that I've said. And then in chapter 17, he starts to pray to the Father. And he, he says, Lord, I've completed the work you've given me to do. I've, I've made you known. And then he starts praying for his disciples. And they're in the upper room with him. This is not in the garden yet. This is in the upper room. And when he gets to chapter, uh, or verse 20 in chapter 17, he actually says he prays not only for the disciples back then, but for all, all of us, all those who will come to faith through his words. Look what it says. It says in, if I can find it here, there it is, yeah. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me because of their message. That's us. He's praying his prayer for us. And what does he pray? He prays that all may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. What's fascinating about this is that we, we might actually say this is the high priestly prayer of Jesus. He knows that in a few hours he's going to be arrested, he's going to be beaten, he's going to be whipped, he's going to be crucified. And yet his passion at this point is for believers, us. 
his disciples then, but his disciples now. And he prays that we would go back to what God intended in the beginning. Father, make them one. Just as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, let them be one in us also. Theologically, I don't know if he's making us part of the Trinity at that point, but I do know this. He's making us all one family. And this is what he prays for at this particular time. Let them be in harmony. And he repeats it. Just as you are me, Father, let them be one in us also. This is his passionate prayer. We might often call the Lord's Prayer, you know, the prayer of Jesus, but the Lord's Prayer was really a pattern or a template that he gave the disciples. Hey, this is how you should pray. But here's what he passionately actually prays for on this night, for that coming back together of what God intended in the beginning, that harmony, that unity, that oneness. You see, he has given that to that. And every day Jesus is praying that prayer for us, every moment that we as the church, as we as families, as we as communities, as we as a nation, as we as the world would come into what God intended in the beginning. Look how good and pleasant it is when brothers come together in unity. There I'm going to give my blessing. And so when we as a church don't fight with one another, when we as a family work through our differences and our conflicts and work for peace, God will bless that. And it's a message to the world of what Christianity is all about. Marriage should be something that the church should look at. And how do you get along with your your wife? How do you get along with your husband so well? Well, you see, it's Jesus in me. In fact, I don't know how you do marriage without Christ. Right? I was married with my wife and I for six years before we became Christ followers. And it was rough. It's rough enough with Christ. But with Christ, we can work on that unity. I think it's going to be on Wednesday, three days from now, we're going to be married for 54 years. Same people, all right? And, and as crazy, I was talking to one lady at the first service, and I said, after, as we went through the pandemic and staying home, and I'm doing all my meetings from home on Zoom and so forth, and, and people are talking about this crazy, I can't wait to get out of the house. I was happy. I was with the person that I loved the most as a human being, somebody I've been married to for 54 years. I get to stay home with her. Wow. Right? It makes a difference. That doesn't mean we don't have disagreements and, and problems, but we can work through them because God is on our side. Jesus is praying for us for our marriages to work. Jesus is praying for our churches that we would be unified and be one and be a family and that we would be an example to the world how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters come together in unity. And then I notice a, a third thing here. It's another passage in, in Genesis where he's talking about the whole role of marriage, which God instituted. God came up with this deal. And in, in Genesis 2, 24 and 25, he says, uh, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Now, I think it's more than becoming flesh, but I think there is that idea that he has given us a way in becoming one flesh through sexual intercourse. There, I mentioned sex for you dads that are home and, and or here and hoping that's part of your uh, Father's Day present. But, you know, uh, but God had created this. God came up with this idea. All right? You know, I think it's okay to talk about in church because he, like, designed it. And, and when we engage in sexual intercourse, what are we doing? We're joined together at that moment physically. And what is God saying? He says, this is a reminder of what you're supposed to be. This is a way to celebrate your oneness. Now, Alan talked earlier about baptism. What is baptism? You know, you get in a tank or a pool or something like that. And I've never been in a baptismal service where I haven't seen people moved emotionally. Is the water too cold? Are there snakes in there? No, it's what it represents. I don't think I've ever been in a communion service where we're taking that little cup and, and that little cracker and we're eating it where people aren't moved emotionally. Is it the cracker? Is it the juice? No, it's what it represents. And in marriage, what is sexual intercourse? It's that same sort of holy thing that will remind us you're one. You're joined together. You see, the world misses out on that by not following Christ. There's a whole spiritual dynamic to lovemaking as Christ followers. 
There's something good about that. And, and remember, God created it. It's good. And here he's saying what? A man is to forsake his parents, leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife. Now understand, in that culture, that was a crazy thing because family was sometimes all people had. I mean, you grew up in a home and, you know, this is, you know, back in the beginning of humankind. And your family was your protection. That was your group. And how? Here he's saying when it comes to marriage, you're starting a new family. So you need to leave that family and be joined to your new spouse and create a new family here. And you become one. And you can be naked and unashamed because this is what God intended in the first place. And so think about that. This is what God wants. So, so what do we need to do today in order to, to bring this back? What are some practical things that we do? One, one of the things that, that I think about is in Romans 12, 18, it says this. It says, if it is possible, if it is possible, and as far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. Now, I like the fact that he says, as much as it depends on you. Because the other person that you're trying to make peace with might not want to do it. But at least you do your part. And if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, be at peace with everybody. All right? Now, isn't one of the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers? For they should be called what? The children of God. We should be children that seek after peace and harmony and unity in all relationships, whether it be in our marriage or whether it be in our, our, our community or, or whether it be in our nation or whether it be in the world. We should always be working for that peace and harmony. So what do we need to do? When you're dealing with another person, maybe we need to stop and listen to them and understand what they're saying before we, 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 we work so much on what we're going to say in defense. I don't know about you, but I've been in arguments at, at times with somebody where we're really saying the same thing. We're just coming from different perspectives, but we meet in the middle. And if we only had taken the time to really, really listen to the other person, maybe we wouldn't have gotten into an argument in the first place. And, and, and when, we, when we do listen to somebody, maybe we need to, to more than listen to their words. And I, maybe I'm talking to guys especially, because uh, there, there's some sort of listening to their heart and their body motion and so forth. I'd rather talk to somebody face to face than, than talk to them on the phone or to text them because they can't see my body language. They can't see the emotion and the feeling if I just write it down. Has anybody ever been in an email war? All right. I guess I'm the only one. I have my hand up, but I've been in one of those where it just got, and, and I remember one faculty member I had an email war, war with, and I, I said, Steve, we've got to stop right now. I'm coming over to your office and, and see you. And again, it was one of those things where we were really saying the same thing, but the words we were putting down were really not communicating our heart. So it's a listening to somebody and listening to their heart and reading their, bi their body language at the same time. Maybe it, it means spending more quality time with people, and, and especially people that are different than us. One of the things I tell them at Southeastern University, I tell the students, hey, when you're at lunch, sit down with somebody different from you. We have people from all over the country and all over the world here on our campus. Sit down with somebody who's different and find out about them. Why did they come to the university? What is their goal? What do they want to uh, find out? You know, what is their purpose? Where do they see themselves in 10 years? And just really listen and get to know somebody who's of a different color or a different ethnic group or has trouble speaking the same language that you have. And they, they speak in a broken English. And really try to hear them and understand them. I grew up in a home, and, and some of you will know this, those of you are older. Uh, my dad was like Archie Bunker. Anybody remember the show All in the Family? All right? Archie was, I mean, he labeled everybody. Well, that, my dad labeled everybody. And I can remember one day him giving me a father-son talk, and he was telling me about every ethnic group and their imperfections. He said, hey, black people are lazy. They don't want to work. Italians, they're good in construction, but they really can't do anything else. Now, it's funny that as a 19-year-old man, all right, probably more boy than man, but as 19, I remember working uh, for uh, some stonemasons, and they hired me as a laborer. And these stonemasons were probably, uh, I think they were 64 and 65 years old. Both came over from the boat from Italy, hardly speak English. 
But they could build a stone wall without cement that would not come down. I mean, they would, they would look at a rock and kind of chip this off and put it, they called it a drywall. And I, I just was amazed at that. I was the guy who carried stones along with a couple of the laborers that were African-American. You know, lazy African-American people. That's what my dad said. These guys were older than me, probably three times my age, and they could outwork me. Now, I'm 19 years old. And when I'd sit down and have lunch with them, they shared their food with me. They were the nicest kind. All my stereotypes were breaking. Why? Spending time with somebody that was different. Getting to know them. Not from a distance, but up close. And starting to hear their heart. You know, we've, we've been going through some racial things right now, and I've talked to different African-American faculty that we have. I said, have you ever been pulled over because of your color? Oh, many times. Many times. And now I have to prepare my son or my daughter for being pulled over simply because of their color. I never had to experience that. I never had to teach my children how to act in that situation. And I can't imagine what it's like being a father and, and preparing your children for that, that you're probably going to be pulled over. Or you're going to be judged because of your color. Right? So I can understand. I think I can start to understand some of these things. But I only learn to understand them as I sit down and talk to my brothers and sisters that are a different racial group or ethnic group or different color, different nationality and find out what their heart is. And this is what God wants us to do. He wants us to come and help us to understand one another. He wants us to be that sort of people. In fact, it means giving up ourself and our selfish desires and maybe even our comfortableness to, to talk to somebody who's different from us. Uh, before I came to Southeastern years ago, I, I pastored a church in Phoenix, and we were a white Hispanic church on the north side of Phoenix, and one of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted to break, again, the racial barriers and the color. So we, we partnered with an inner-city African-American church. And what we did, we would do work days together at one another's church. Uh, we would go into their church and have a service. They would come to our church. And, and, and again, it helped our congregation to break down these barriers because we looked at these passages regarding unity and said the only way we're going to really bring them about is that we've got to get out of our comfort zone and spend time with people that are different from us. We had to give up ourself and our comfort. But isn't that what Jesus did for us? Being comfortable in heaven, not having to experience this life, not have to work for a carpenter for 30 years, you know, uh, in that time, and then finally go on a ministry where most of your own nationality rejected you and thought you were crazy. Why did Jesus spend 30 years that we really don't know about before he started his public ministry? I think all-knowing God would know what we go through, but I think not only was enough to all know, he wanted to experience it firsthand. So God was willing to come out of his comfort zone to be with us, to take us to a place that we can be in harmony and unity with one another. If our Father in heaven did that, how much are we as individuals, as Christ followers, as mothers and fathers, as young men and young women, as old men and women, need to come out of our comfort zone. So it means dying to self. What does this say about marriage in Ephesians 5.25? It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. There's part of us that if we're going to break through all these barriers that we're facing with, and disunity. We've got to come out of our comfort zone. We've got to die to self. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I carry around in my body the death of Christ so that the life of Christ can come through. Now, I think he means a couple of things. I, I think he not only means what, what Jesus died for, but I think it's also what he died to every day as a human being, the, the opportunity to, to do his own selfish thing. But Jesus died to that. Every day. What did he say? He says, hey, these are not my words. These are the words of the Father. Look at the works I do. These are not my works. These are the works I see my Father do. Jesus did not do his own thing. He was tempted that way. Tempted that way on the wilderness. Hey, you can, you can turn this. You're hungry. You've been fasting for 40 days. You can turn these stones into, into bread. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He came here to do the will of the Father. He died to self. 
And as we die to ourselves, it's the only way that Christ's life can come through us. There's things that I don't want to do at times, but the Holy Spirit nudges me to do. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Give her the TV clicker. Let her turn on the home and garden network. That's going to cost you time and money because she's going to want that. I'll tell you, I, just, I don't want to give that clicker, but I've got to die to self if I want to be that way. It means doing things that sometimes are uncomfortable, but God blesses that. God blesses those that live together in harmony. So in, in marriage, it's working through those difficulties. It's forgiving our spouse. It's forgiving our enemy. Hey, look in the Lord's Prayer. Hey, what does it say? It says, you know, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. I think forgiveness is to be a daily thing as well. I want to hold on to this anger. I want to hold on to a business. And God is saying, forgive them. Only then can you be in unity. Get over it. And so this is what he said. So what do we need to do? We need to deny ourselves, take up our cross. We need to live out the Ten Commandments as best we can with the help of the Holy Spirit. It's great that you have a church with a pastor who gives you these foundational truths that come across because those are the things that we hold on when the whole world seems to be breaking apart. This Christianity stuff works. Jesus works. And he can help us as the church to make a difference in our marriages, in our home, with our children, in our community, if we as the church, as the body of Christ, will choose to deny ourselves and follow after him. So let's do it. I want to do it. Do you want to bring unity and harmony? I want to see more love and less hate. But I need to be a part of that. I need to pray for that. And we are the body of Christ. Are you with me on that? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So Father, we, we celebrate who you are, and what you have made us as Christ followers. You pray that we would be one and get along with one another, get along with ourselves, get along with you. And Father, continue that prayer because there are days I know I need it. I need to forgive more. I need to be more understanding. I need to walk in your, your steps and follow your practices more and more. And I think there's others here today that feel the same thing. So help us as the church, as fellow believers, to start walking in the way that you want us to walk, to be peacemakers, to understand one another, and to forgive one another and to show love. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, church. Thank you, church. God bless you.